It's a skill that is very accessible. It's not like a rocket science. Uh, it's not like you have to know everything. You can do a lot of it by yourself. You don't need anybody's permission to do anything. You can just break things and it just build back up. Nothing happens. You don't have to be someone who sits in front of a computer 24-7. So you have programmers who are writing code for the graphics in movies like Marvel Avengers and Star Wars. It's everywhere and you have coding everywhere. Today, when you think about programming, the retail industry probably isn't the first place you'd think there will be demand for it. But a report by the job site Glassdoor shows that the retail industry has more than doubled its share of software job postings from 2012 to 2017. And this becomes clear when you consider retail experiences such as browsing for groceries online, or receiving personalized shopping recommendations, or even the future of cashless stores. All of these depend on some form of programming. Furthermore, the World Economic Forum in their Future of Jobs 2020 report noted that across industries, more than half of the job roles that are increasing in demand by 2025 will require some form of programming. So in this video, I want to go into what is programming, how this skill connects to our world, and what are some of the challenges of learning programming. I would say programming is how you tell the computer explicitly how to do things. Based on what instructions you give the computer, it will either give you a response or it will help you do something. Whether you know it or not, almost all aspects of our lives are shaped by programming. From socializing to consuming content, from the mobile device in our pocket to the power grid that supplies electricity to our home, all of these things rely on a computer that's programmed with instructions that translate code into real-world actions. These instructions that the computer understands are represented in ones and zeros. But modern day programming doesn't involve writing a bunch of ones and zeros. Instead, a programming language is used. The way how I am now talking to you, it's a way for us to talk to computers because that's a language that they understand. Like when you communicate with a Chinese person, you have to speak Chinese. You want to tell a computer what to do, you have to, you know, use programming language. And similar to human language, there are hundreds of programming languages to choose from like C++, Java, Python, Swift, and MATLAB. Each language is like a tool and depending on the problem that needs to be solved, some programming languages will be better suited than others. And what sets each programming language apart is its syntax. A syntax is a set of rules that defines a combination of symbols that can be understood by a computer. Like how human language is driven by grammar and vocabulary, syntax defines how instructions for the computer should be expressed. Here's an example of a program written in the programming language Python. This program will convert a temperature from Fahrenheit into Celsius and then display the resulting conversion. As you can see, these few lines of code can be easily read by anyone that can read English as it's just a combination of English keywords. But this wasn't always the case. Prior to 1955, computer programs were expressed in mathematical symbols, which made programming hard and inaccessible to anyone that didn't have an engineering or math degree. But that all changed when Admiral Grace Harbour developed Flowmatic, a first-of-its-kind compiler that could convert English keywords into coded instructions that a computer could understand. And that simple idea set the precedence for how programming languages are today. When I was a freshman in China, a lot of us were trying to get a certificate of C language programming. I did not understand why people were rushing to do that, but I followed as peer pressure. Today, more and more people are learning programming for various reasons, whether it be to better understand how computers work, or to upskill oneself to be more competitive in the job market. I think what we're learning today is that the common skill to have is to work with software. Um, and that's, that can either be creating the software or using the software. Coding might become what MS Word was back then, which is just like, okay, you gotta at least have some idea or be just a little bit familiar with what's going on. However, there is a certain degree of hesitancy when it comes to learning programming because it's seen as this skill that's both hard to learn and intimidating. People perceive it to have an extremely high barrier to entry. Um, like it, it just isn't possible for me to even approach understanding what's going on. I see a lot of people just kind of go, ah, well that's software, I can't touch it. A lot of people think you have to think a certain way. Uh to be a programmer. There's just this idea that, oh, like coders are supposed to be like nerdy dudes who are in a dark room all day typing away. All of this adds up to programming being regarded as this exclusive talent reserved only for a select few. But in recent years, organizations such as Black Ghost Code, Code.org, and Ghost to Code are creating programs to erase this imaginary barrier as to who can learn programming and computer science. Stick around to the very end of the video to learn more about how you can try your hand at learning programming today. 
When talking about programming, the first thing that comes up in most people's mind is someone writing code on a computer. Everybody thinks if you're a programmer, you just stare at a laptop all the time. But there's a lot of thinking that goes on away from the laptop that I think people forget. While it is true that programming does involve writing a lot of code, the goal of programming is more so about finding a solution to a problem. These solutions come in various forms, such as an algorithm that recommends movies based on your viewing history, or a website that shows if a McDonald's near you has a broken ice cream machine, or a platform that enables anyone to easily share and view videos on the internet. And this problem-solving aspect of programming is something that's commonly overlooked by many because the focus is mostly placed on learning the syntax and writing the code, but not much on the actual problem that is being solved. What this means is that when someone is programming, they not only need to understand how to write code with a programming language, but more importantly, they also need to know what to write. Computers are like really dumb. <laughs> the computer won't help you, whether it's to understand the problem or whether it's to give the solution. It's you who have to do both of the things. Like as a human, you kind of know, like you just got to do this, right? But a computer is not going to understand that unless if you explain things like step by step. Essentially, you are the only one who is coming with the solution. A uh, computer is just a medium uh, to execute the program. So in the programming and computer science world, there is this technique called decomposition. It refers to this process of breaking down a problem into smaller sub-problems that are easier to approach and to solve. For example, if I want to organize these 10 books in alphabetical order by their title using this technique of decomposition, I will break this problem down into three distinct sub-problems that are grouping the books based on the first letter of the title, sorting the book titles in their individual first letter groups, and sorting all the first letter groups in alphabetical order. And when I'm done solving each of these sub-problems, all the books will be properly organized in alphabetical order. Now breaking this problem down into multiple sub-problems might look trivial, but as problems grow in size, like when there are hundreds or even thousands of books, you can begin to see the advantage of decomposition. And strategies like this is the magic sauce that enables programmers and computer scientists alike to approach complex problems in fields that are unrelated to computer science, like predicting a patient's risk of getting cardiovascular diseases, or understanding the effects of increased global temperatures. Now this goes to show that programming is more than just lines of code on a computer screen, it's fundamentally about solving problems in the real world. People who don't have a technical background perceive that it's some kind of special skill when, when really it really is just being able to break down things. It's very rooted in how humans think and how humans solve problems. It's the way of thinking. It actually enables you to, to critical think and make trade-offs of how you might do something more efficiently. And the beauty of programming is that once you tell the computer how to do something, it will repeat it exactly the way you described it every single time. So, I made this Sudoku solver. I tried to think of the ways I solve a Sudoku puzzle. Like, what are, what's my strategy? What's the first thing I look for? What are the rules I follow? And I translated those rules into code. I tested it on really difficult level Sudoku problems, like puzzles I can't solve, but my code could solve it using the same logic that I use. So this just shows that, you know, we are we make mistakes, we forget things often, but if we employ the same rules, the code actually does a better job of it. Furthermore, the methods and techniques that programming teaches us can extend beyond the realm of programming. You can make an analogy for a lot of those characteristics with almost every aspect of life. And I don't think people kind of get that, right? It's like, wow, if you've done some type of solution and software, there's probably an analogy in real life that if you broke it down similarly or thought about real life that way, you could actually solve a lot of life's problems fairly efficiently, especially when it becomes habit. For example, if you're in a grocery store and trying to rush home to begin cooking for your dinner party, but all the checkout lines are packed full of people with their shopping carts. So to make it home as soon as possible, you need to pick the quickest checkout line and the obvious way is to pick the one that has the least number of people and shopping carts. But if you were to employ a programmer's mindset of optimizing solutions, you would try to rank which checkout line is objectively faster by considering on things like which checkout line has the least number of items in the shopping carts, noticing which cashier scans items faster, and seeing which line has people that look like they're also rushing to get home. And by analyzing all these different points, you can kind of rank which checkout line will actually get you home the quickest. This technique of quantifying things while solving problems is basically what programmers do when they're trying to write code that needs to conform to either a technical limitation or a business requirement. And this is just one of the examples of how programming can transcend into your daily life. And as you dive deeper into programming, 
you start to be more subconsciously aware of how your brain approaches certain things. When talking about programming, several sentiments come to mind such as programming is hard, or you need to be good at math to learn programming, or programming is only for guys. These are just some of the mental hurdles that novice programmers will encounter. I think the idea that, oh, it's really frustrating and your first code is never gonna be the right, all of those things just really discourages people from even getting started. Like, oh, what's the point if I can't? And from anecdotal conversations that I had with individuals as part of this video, there's a common consensus that sentiments like these are a false projection of what programming is. The fact is that everyone will have a different experience with programming, and something like the speed at which someone understands a programming concept doesn't imply that the person is better at programming. Moreover, programming is a skill that requires continual effort because of how broad it is. There's always something new to learn, and no one is expected to know everything. There were a lot of unknowns, essentially. I, I wasn't sure if I was doing something right, um, or if this is supposed to feel like this. So much of programming is walking into a project and really not knowing exactly what to do, but knowing that you'll be able to figure it out. It feels like we were raised to feel like we need to just know all of it in our head without any outside help at all times. That's not possible with something like programming. You're not gonna know every piece of line of code and ha be able to just have the solution for every problem in your head. See, the thing with programming is that problems come in many different shapes and forms. That means that programmers will need to solve problems by adapting the concepts that they know and the solutions that they have come up with in the past. And that process often involves a lot of trial and error, which causes frustrations and feelings of inadequacy. That leap between like, okay, that's a cool concept, I guess, but how does it apply to anything that I already know? If, and if somebody doesn't make that connection for you, then I think the default for most people is to think, oh, I guess this isn't for me. That's why a lot of beginner programming materials specifically focus on developing mental models for core programming concepts like variables, data types, and loops. These mental models can come in the form of relating programming concepts to real-world actions or trying to visualize what's happening when a piece of code is running. For instance, one of the first programming concepts that any programmer will learn is variables. And it's commonly taught with the mental model that a variable is a box that you can put things into and label it with a name, rather than thinking of it as a location in the computer's memory where things are stored. Developing mental models like this is crucial because they will influence how programmers think and approach programming problems. And apart from this, another challenge that every programmer will encounter is bugs. But even if you don't know programming at all, chances are that you have experienced a bug when using a computer or any piece of technology for that matter. In programming, bugs are unexpected behaviors like an application crashing after performing a sequence of actions, or a smartphone's battery getting drained if an app is not properly closed. These bugs happen because computers are designed to do anything that humans program them to do, so if a programmer doesn't write or forgets to write the code to handle a certain scenario, when the computer encounters such a scenario, it will just error out. Consider this, in 2014, Sai's Gangnam Style video was the first to hit 2,147,483,647 views on YouTube. And it was also the first to hit a negative view count. This negative view count was a bug. And it happened because the developers at YouTube never thought that a video would ever reach that number of views, so they set the view count to be a 32-bit signed integer which had a max value of positive 2.1 billion. This goes to show that every programmer, regardless of their experience, will encounter bugs when they are programming, and the common way of resolving bugs is to search for answers online. There's a lot of memes talk about like how the programmer's job is just Googling and copy and paste the other's code, which is kind of true. Like, as long as you understand the logic, like the code itself, you can copy and paste. Like, what, what is a GitHub, right? People get stuff from, like, that's okay. People are doing that in real life. Okay, it's not cheating. Um, so yeah, for sure, go online, get an internet connection. But as easy as it is to get answers online, some of them are not the easiest to understand, either because the author described the solution from a different context, or the solution requires some prerequisite knowledge. This is where having a friend, mentor, or programming buddy comes in handy. You need a support system. There are so many nuances in those programming that if I don't know, I would ask you, Dick Wing, that would make life so much easier. So studying a language by yourself, it's draining and it's sometimes uh, frustrating when you can't get your questions answered to really understand this concept. 
Thankfully, the programming world is sprawling with communities and forums that cater to everything from a particular programming language to a particular geographic location. So the challenging part really is to reach out and form that connection with someone out there. Doing it alone is an experience and some people really like that strategy and they like the, the thrill of figuring out by themselves. But I think there's a lot of people that um, want the community aspect of being a developer or a programmer. There were times when I just felt like I was so incapable of doing it, but realizing that, oh, I can like reach out for help. And then like finally, maybe a few weeks later, getting to that point. Like, I think that those are the times where I was like, oh my gosh, that was a lot. That was so tiring, but that felt really cool. Suffice to say, programming has its fair share of challenges, but it's not impossible to overcome these challenges if you're willing to put in the effort. Programming and coding definitely has reached that point where anybody and everybody can pick it up. It's just to what point you want to pick it up to. I think anyone who practices well enough and keeps going and has the determination to not give up and the patience um, could really succeed. And at the end of the day, the significance of programming extends beyond this ability to tell the computer what to do. And once you understand how programming relates to the world around you, the sky really is the limit. For so long, engineers, coders, software programmers, we get painted with the nerd brush, right? And it's good, and even though, yeah, those guys may be part nerd, they've made it cool. And it's now it's cool to be a nerd. So if you're interested in programming, you can find an excuse to do it and apply it to your daily life. That That's there. There's every way for you to do that. Alright, we made it to the very end of this mini documentary about programming. This video is my contribution towards Computer Science Education Week, the annual call to action to teach, inspire, and advocate for computer science education. This year's CS Epic team is CS Everywhere, and as you've seen in this video, programming touches every part of our world today, and is a skill for individuals both young and old, professional and inexperienced. So I would invite you to try learning it for yourself today. Head on over to www.code.org forward slash hour of code to join millions of students of all ages that are learning the basics of computer science and programming through an interactive tutorial. There is no prerequisite to any of these tutorials. So as long as you have a computer with an internet access and know how to navigate a website, you're already halfway there. Also, I'll put a list of resources right below that like button that you can refer to about learning programming and computer science but anyway, I hope you found meaning in this video. Feel free to share this with anyone that might benefit from it. As a software engineer and someone that studied computer science back in college, I have been asked this question, what is programming, so many times over the years, and that's one of the main reasons why I decided to make this mini documentary. The conversations that I had with friends, coworkers, and acquaintances as part of this video helped me understand programming on a deeper level, and that enabled me to tell the story from different perspectives. Later this month, I'll be doing a deep dive into my journey of making this mini documentary where I'll touch on some of the challenges I have faced and talk about some parts that didn't make it to the final video. But in the meantime, if you want to see more videos just like this, check out my Computer Science Education Week playlist right here on my YouTube channel where I touch on other topics like is a computer science degree worth it or how I started my programming journey. Again, thanks for watching, happy holidays, and I hope to see you very soon in the next video.